So this new segment is about uh, morphology and the lexicon. So when people learn new words, they store them in what is known in linguistics and psychology as the mental lexicon. It is used to store the meaning, the pronunciation, and the part of speech, among other things. So if I tell you to store a, a word like cat, you will know that this is a little furry creature that says meow. You know that it's pronounced cat as in k, a, t, and you know that it's a noun. Sometimes you may not know all of this information and yet still be able to store this information in the mental lexicon. For example, if you see the word wug for the first time, you may not know what its part of speech is. You can probably figure out its pronunciation and you probably don't know what its meaning is. But if I told you that wug is a noun and that it means a small creature, you can use it in a sentence because you would know the part of speech of the meaning. You can say, for example, things like, I saw a wug today or a wug walked by. Similarly, uh, a word like kluvius, uh, even if you don't know its meaning, you may be able to infer some information about it because most words in English that have this uh, form are adjectives. You can even reason about words that you haven't seen before. You can compare draftful and draftless and figure out that they're most likely opposites because there are many pairs of words in English that have those particular endings and have uh, antonymy relationship. So one of so the things that we're interested in today is uh, how to interpret those words morphologically. So if you take a word like kluvius, uh, can you figure out what its ending is and why you think that this is an adjective? So uh, people have intuition, they have uh, a grammar that they're born with that helps them understand uh, words that they have not seen before. And they can also uh, have this property called productivity, which allows them to create new words and have them mean different things. Let's look now at some of the words that you store in your mental lexicon. A word like runs. Clearly, it has two possible meanings in English. In one of the cases, it is a noun, plural, and in the second case, it is a verb in third person, singular. So clearly, its part of speech changes, its meaning changes, its pronunciation doesn't seem to change in this particular case, but it is ambiguous. So there are, has to be a way for people to store ambiguous words in their mental lexicon and disambiguate them on the fly when they pronounce or read sentences. There are also some special cases of words that are stored as what is known as allomorphs. For example, cats is a derivative of cat, it means the plural of a singular cat, but there are some special cases like oxen, which is formed irregularly as a plural of ox. Uh, the past tense of play is played, but one of the past tenses of swing is swung, which is again formed irregularly. So those words have to be stored in uh, the lexicon somehow, and they may not be obtainable directly by following some morphological derivation, like cats. So words have a lot of affixes. They include things like prefixes that go in front of the stem, uh, suffixes, endings, and so on. So one of the subjects of morphology is called derivation of morphology. It has to do with understanding how different forms of words are created from other words by adding different uh, affixes. So if we look at the word drinkable, we can say that the whole word drinkable is an adjective. You remember that JJ is the standard label in natural language processing for adjectives. We also know that drinkable is formed by converting the verb drink into an adjective by adding uh, the suffix able. So we can represent the whole word drinkable as some sort of a tree which has v, the verb drink first, uh, the suffix able, and then those two words combine form the new word drinkable. So there are many cases in English where we have suffixes that change the part of speech of a word. So er is one such example. So for example, to sleep is a verb and sleeper uh, which has multiple meanings, is a noun derived from sleep by adding the suffix er. So we can, in many cases, infer the meaning of some of the morphemes. For example, the morpheme able means capable of doing the verb. The uh, suffix er may be a person who does a certain activity. So let's try this with a few of those morphemes. So ness, for example, is used to form nouns. For example, we can have sleepy, which is a adjective. Sleepiness is a noun that is derived from sleepy. So the affix ness turns an adjective into a noun. 
able, we already saw, can turn a verb into an adjective. And then we can also similarly consider the meaning of some other prefixes and suffixes, such as ing. Re, for example, is usually used at the beginning of a word and it means to repeat something. Un means negation, for example, do and undo. And finally, er for adjectives means the comparative form of the adjective. So in the example that I showed you, we can draw a diagram that tells us that the jj is uh, transformed into a sequence of a verb followed by the suffix able. And it turns out that uh, morphemic rules can be used uh, recursively. So a long word like unconcernedness says is really formed from concern by adding first the uh, suffix ed, then another suffix ness, uh, and then negating it, and finally adding an extra es at the end for plural. So in some cases, it's very easy to look at um, complicated word and figure out how it was derived. But in other cases, we may have ambiguities. For example, the word undoable, as you will see on the next slide, can have two different morphological interpretations, whereas a word like unbelievable, we only have one. Can you think why this is the case? So let's look at the examples on the previous slide. Undoable, this can be formed as unable to be done, so something that is undoable, or it can, it's something that is able to be undone. In this case, it will be analyzed as undoable. Now, this doesn't apply to unbelievable because one of the interpretations is the same as for undoable. It's something that is unable to be believed. But the second interpretation, able to be unbelieved, sounds very unnatural. So in this case, we don't have any ambiguity. Let's look now at some morphological examples. Uh, in different languages, uh, we can have rules that are not as simple as the ones that we have in English, just adding an S for plural, for example. So in uh, the language uh, Pangasinan, we can have a re reduplication of some of the uh, morphemes. So amigo is friend, amimigo is the plural for friend. So in this case, we have a reduplication of a morpheme in the middle of the word. Similarly, in Samoan, uh, the word savali means he travels, savavali is the plural for they travel. We can have circumfixes. For example, in German, uh, the word spielen is the infinitive of the word, verb to play, and gespielt is the past form for it. So in this case, we have a circumfix because part of the morpheme goes to the beginning of the word, the ge part, and part goes at the end, in this case, the t form. Uh, we can even look at some artificial phenomena. For example, a, a language that kids are familiar with is Pig Latin. In Pig Latin, you take uh, the first syllable of the word and you move it at the end. So from happy, you get something like api hey. And there are some other fun languages like this in other countries. For example, Verlan, which is a French uh, slang language. Uh, the word Verlan comes from l'envers which in French means in reverse. So if you reverse the syllables of l'envers, you get verlan. And it includes words like cefran, which is the verlan form for français by switching the two syllables, as well as ripou, which is the uh, switched uh, version of pourri, which means uh, a crook. Now let me give an example in English. You may have heard this expression. Where are you going? I'm going to Massa freaking Chusets. You can insert a phrase like this in the middle of some word, but you cannot just insert it randomly. For example, if you had Massachusetts, you wouldn't be able to say ma freaking Massachusetts or Massachusetts freaking sets. So clearly, freaking cannot be inserted in any random place. Uh, where would you insert it, for example, in the word education? Could you say educa freaking shun? That doesn't sound natural, can, but you can probably say edu freaking cation. So the rule is actually that the freaking infix is inserted to the left of the syllable that bears the main stress. So as, as I said earlier, you can say edu freaking cation, but you cannot say edu freaking shun or e freaking education. And there are some exceptions, but this rule applies in most cases. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the morphemes of a word are individual units of morphological meaning. They include the stems and the affixes of the word. So affixes are prefixes, suffixes, and endings. 
There are some languages that have concatenated morphology, like English, for example, where the affix is added to the beginning or to the end of the word. But there are also cases of templatic morphology as well. So, for example, in Semitic languages, uh, here's an example from Hebrew. Uh, the, in the template for learn is LMD. It's just a sequence of three consonants. But if we want to conjugate it or inflect it, we can get different forms of learn. For example, Lamad, which is he studied, Limed, which is he taught, and Lumad, which means uh, he was taught. So by inserting vowels, different sets of vowels in different places, we can modify the uh, consonant template and form different words. Now let's look at uh, inflectional morphology, which is one of the main areas of morphology. Words can have uh, different inflections based on tense, such as present, past, and future. Number, uh, first and second and third, for example, I, you, or he or she. Person, in English that's singular and plural, but other languages have other persons, for example, duo, which is used for two people. Mood, things like indicative, subjunctive, conditional, aspect, for example, progressive and perfective. English words have at most five verb forms, for example, the verb to be has am, are, was, were, and been. Uh, there are how many, however, 40 different forms in French. There are six cases in Russian. You can look at the website uh, listed here for some examples. And it, there can be as many as 40,000 forms of the same word in Turkish. For example, there can be a special form that means you can cause X to cause Y to dot 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 to do Z. So you can have a recursive set of rules that create really long words. Morphological analysis is an area of natural language processing that takes a word and converts it into a morphological representation. This is related to stemming, but it does more than just stem the word. It also gives you the part of speech and any morphological information associated with the word. So for example, the word sleeps is translated as the infinitive sleep then a label for verb, a label for third person, and a label for singular. The word done is translated as the infinitive for the verb do, uh, followed by uh, a label for the verb v, and a pp, which in this case stands for past participle. Now let me show you some interesting phenomena uh, that are related to morphology uh, in different languages. So the first one is an example of Turkish vowel harmony. As I mentioned before, uh, vowels can be grouped into front and back and high and low. Uh, in English, uh, this is a very common distinction between uh, vowels. In Turkish, there's an additional uh, distinction between rounded and unrounded vowels. So every time you have a vowel that is formed by uh, putting your mouth in an unrounded position, you can round your lips like this and change uh, the sound uh, to a different vowel. So for example, e, u. E, U. So in Turkish, there are eight vowels in total, which form all the possible combinations of front and back, high and low, and unrounded and rounded vowels. So the back vowels are formed in the back of the uh, mouth, and the front vowels are formed in the front of the mouth. So in vowel harmony, uh, we have a principle that says that within the same word, you can only have back vowels or only have front vowels. There are other languages that have this property in addition to Turkish, for example, Hungarian. So let's look at an example. So the suffix da or de in Turkish is used to indicate location, in, on, or at. But we use da if the rest of the vowels in the word are back vowels, and we use de if the rest of the vowels in the word are front vowels. So let's look at the examples here. In the room, is oda da, because the word oda, which means room, has only back vowels, and therefore we add da at the end, which is another back vowel. Kapu is door, kapu da is at the door. And now we have three examples with front vowels. Ev is home, at home is evde, göl is lake, gölde is at the lake, and finally kupru is bridge and Kuprude is on the bridge. In fact, uh, I want to point you to a NACLO problem that talks about Turkish vowel harmony and some other interesting phenomena. 
you can access it from this website and then when you're done solving it you can look at the solution which is available here. So let's look at another example from Turkish uh, which shows you how complicated morphology can be in different languages. So this is a slide courtesy of from Kemal Flazer from Qatar. Uh, he shows how one can take an English sentence, an entire sentence, and convert it to a single English word by following uh, the morphological rules of Turkish. So here's the word in Turkish. It's the one listed at the bottom. And it means if we will be able to make something dot 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 become strong. So in the first step, we start with that sentence. And then we label in different colors the different modifications to strong. For example, the future tense will, uh, the possibility be able, and the property of becoming something. So then we reorder those labels to get them in uh, the order they have to be in Turkish. So strong is the stem. And then all of the other pieces uh, form uh, morphological inflections. So become is the first, that adds lash, and then to make something is ter, be able is a bill, will is a check, if is se, and finally we goes to the very end, and that is the final affix k, which gives us this long word at the bottom. And here's another example from uh, Japanese, uh, which shows you how Japanese have imported a lot of words from English and uh, they use uh, katakana, which is one of the main alphabets in uh, Japanese, uh, to represent different sounds and different morphological combinations that come from English. So for example, uh, right in the middle of the slide, we have kohi, uh, which stands for coffee. So you see that the F sound was changed to H, and we have uh, those macrons or bars on top of the two vowels to indicate that both syllables are long syllables. And let's look at one more example. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Re Su Toran, which stands for restaurant. And the reason why uh, the second syllable has a vowel in it, Re Su Toran, is because in uh, Japanese grammar, the only kinds of uh, syllables that are allowed are the ones that end in a vowel, with only one exception, uh, the syllables that end in vowel followed by the letter N. So that's why we have to insert this U in the middle of restaurant. So now we're going to move on to some other levels of linguistic analysis. We looked at morphology, let's see what comes next. So one of the other levels is semantics. So semantics is the study of the meaning of words and sentences, and it can be split into lexical semantics and compositional semantics. So lexical semantics has to do with the meaning of individual words and the relationships between the meanings of uh, pairs of words. So that includes some specific uh, lexical relationships such as synonyms, uh, but also hypernyms and hyponyms, which are special terms for more general and more specific concepts, antonyms, and so on. We're going to look at those in more detail in one of the future lectures. So lexical semantics also uh, deals with uh, the senses of words. For example, some words that have multiple senses are known as polysemous words. It also talks about collocation. So collocation is a sequence of words that appear together more frequently than what you would expect uh, if you just combine the probabilities of the individual words. So for example, stock market it appears more frequently than stock and market multiplied by each other. We also have idioms. Those are specific collocations that have a meaning that is not literally inferable from uh, the components. So for example, to kick the bucket, is an expression in English that means to die. So obviously it doesn't mean to kick any particular bucket. So in addition to lexical semantics, we have also compositional semantics, which deals with understanding the meaning of a sentence based on the meaning of its components. We will talk about lexical semantics and compositional semantics later. The next level of study in linguistics is called pragmatics, and that is the study of how knowledge about the world and language conventions interact with literal meaning. It covers things like speech acts, resolution of anaphoric relations, for example, pronouns, and it covers the modeling of speech acts in dialogue. So later this semester, we're going to look at pragmatics in more detail. And there are many other areas of linguistics which are not directly related to natural language processing, so we'll just list them here very briefly. 
sociolinguistics, which is the interaction of social organization and language, historical linguistics, which studies the change of languages over time, linguistic typology that looks at how languages are related to each other and have common properties, language acquisition of first and second language, and finally psycholinguistics, which is the study of how people produce and perceive language in real time.